These are 23 criticisms of the Quran that you've probably heard from almost every single anti-Islamic apologist. All of these that I'm going to talk about today come from this video in particular by Saiten and the Rationalizer, and it's called The Sound of Muslims. This is a song that satirically states many, many so-called errors in the Quran that basically makes our entire religion sound like a joke. But yeah, today I'm just going to go through every single one, one by one, and yeah, I'm just going to explain and refute all of the errors that he made in this song. Now, obviously, because music is haram, I used AI to remove the instrumental from this song, so the only thing you'll hear today is the lyrics. Anyways, this is going to be a really long video, so if you have a prayer coming up, please just, you know, save this video for another time. Otherwise, you know, grab some popcorn, grab some dates, whatever, you know, get some water to stay hydrated, and uh, yeah, let's get into it. It's going to be a very long video. Let's go on to the first verse. Talking hands, talking feet, ears that talk too. Talking flesh and eyes bear witness against you. All right, so here the writer is referencing Surah An Nur, verse 24, and Surah Fusilat, verse 20. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that our body parts, so our hands, eyes, skin, etc., will all testify against us truthfully on the day of judgment. The ears will say what we listened to willingly, the mouth will say what we said, the eyes will say what we looked at, and so on. Now, this happens on Yawm al Qiyamah, or the day of judgment, and of course it happens after death and after the end of the universe. And obviously, because it happens after death in presumably a completely different dimension, saying that this is unrealistic is completely useless. It doesn't mean anything because this happens on the day of judgment. And if you want to disbelieve in this, that's your choice. But disbelieving in something completely metaphysical that's going to happen after the end of the universe makes no sense because for that you have to first disbelieve in the rest of Islam. And this cannot be used as a proof or a criticism against Islam because this is completely miraculous and metaphysical and it's completely impossible to prove or disprove that this will happen. Next line. Dissected birds fly home to Abraham. It's all written here in the Noble Quran. So this one's referring to Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 260, where Ibrahim salam asked Allah to show him how he gives life to the dead. And Allah asked him, don't you already believe? And Abraham said yes, but he only asked so that his heart may be satisfied. And what this means is that he wants to be a billion percent sure that this is the truth. He wanted to have complete trust that this is the true religion. Because you know, when you actually know or believe something to be true without even the smallest doubt, the dawah you can give and the conviction you have is completely unmatched. So Allah commanded him to get four birds and to train them to come back to him. You know how they would do with like, you know, messenger pigeons and stuff. Allah then commanded him to slaughter these four birds and to place their body parts on four different hills. Then Allah commanded him to call them again and the little filleted bits started to run towards him and come together. Now obviously it doesn't take a genius to say that this is unrealistic. Personally, I've never seen my filleted chicken running or even walking for that matter. But that's literally the point. This event was used by Allah to show Abraham that he is omnipotent and that Islam is the true religion. And for this to work, it obviously has to be a miracle, which by definition is something that is scientifically impossible according to our observable laws of the universe. So disbelief in this relies on disbelief in God. If you think this is unrealistic, that is literally the point. But using this as a reason to not believe in God is circular reasoning. Next one. The earth existed before there were stars. All right, this one's referring to verses 10 to 12 of Surah Fusilat. And it's also mentioned in verse 29 of Surah Al-Baqarah, where Allah says that he formed the earth, placed mountains on it, and then he formed the heaven into the seven heavens. Now, of course, with the English translation, it sounds like the earth was created first and then the heavens, right? But you actually don't hear this from Arabic speakers because Arabic speakers know that the word then here is thumma in Arabic. And thumma is a very complex word. If you want a full Arabic lesson on the word thumma, just click this card here. But basically, thumma is not just used chronologically, right? It doesn't just mean I did this, then I did that. It's also used to indicate rank, importance or relevance, right? So the order of these verses and the order of these parts of verses doesn't necessarily mean that the first one happened before the next one. It could just be that the first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says was more relevant or more important than the next thing. And it is true that the formation of the earth is more important to us than the formation of the heavens. And this is in conjunction with the views of many of the early Mufassirun. Additionally, if you look at the wording in Surah Al-Baqarah, you'll also see that Allah didn't create the seven heavens. He formed the heaven into the seven heavens, which could have happened after the creation of the earth. We don't know that. But the predominant interpretation is the first one that I just mentioned. Anyways, next one. The moon emits light and was split into parts. All right, this one's referring to Surah Nuh, verse 16, where Allah says that he made the moon a light and the sun a burning lamp. And he uses two different Arabic words here. For the moon, he uses Nuran, which is translated as light. And for the sun, he uses Sirajan, or lamp, because the sun does indeed emit its own light. So there's no problem in that. But the issue is with the word Nuran. Of course, this dude thinks that this is referring to the moon emitting its own light, but obviously we know that's not true 
because the moon reflects the light of the sun. Now the word Nuran is actually used in two different ways here. Firstly, a different Arabic word is used to differentiate between the nature of the sun's light and the moon's light. So the interpretation of this verse is not limited to one where the moon emits its own light, because the word Nuran doesn't specifically imply that the light is being emitted. Furthermore, the word Nuran has been used in different ways in the Quran. Most often it's been used as a way to describe a light of guidance. So in this verse, it refers to the Quran as being a light of guidance, and in this verse, it refers to the revelations that Musa salam received. So because Nuran is often translated as a light of guidance, some say that Surah Nuh is also referring to the moon as being a light of guidance, because it helps people to take track of the time, especially for us Muslims and the people of Musa's time, because we all use lunar calendars. And the next one, the moon was split in two parts. This is referring to verse 1 of Surah Al-Kamar, where Allah plainly states that the moon was split in two. And this is of course in reference to the time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala split the moon in half to convince the Sahaba and the disbelievers that Islam is the truth. So again, this was a miracle, just like the cut birds from earlier. And this was used to strengthen the belief of the people who already believed, and of course to also make the disbelievers believe. So people often see this, and first they say, oh, I don't believe in miracles but some do actually give it the benefit of the doubt and they say okay sure miracles can happen but then they ask for historical evidence and this is where the main argument that people bring against this is so the main argument that people put up against this is that there are no historical records outside of Islamic ones that can confirm this but yeah the reason for this is simple if the moon was seen splitting in other parts of the world people could easily take credit for it you know they could say oh I did that I'm I'm God I'm the Prophet you know whatever they could have done that right you know people who lived a few countries away wouldn't be able to link it to the Prophet Muhammad it would just be impossible and it would lead to mass confusion. So it's believed that the moon could have just been made to appear normal to everyone, or alternatively, it could have just been covered up with clouds or a thunderstorm. It could have also been late at night where most people are asleep, and those who weren't asleep probably just thought they were tripping balls and went back to sleep. If anyone did write it down, it's completely possible that they just didn't preserve it. I mean, the moon split in half and then it came back together again. There was no consequences or anything. It just happened, so there's not much reason for someone to preserve a document about that. Another great argument is that logically, if the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was a fake prophet, why would he make this big, you know, big rumor? He would know that people wouldn't believe it if it didn't actually happen, right? How could he convince all the Sahaba and all the disbelievers that this happened. He couldn't have. So yeah, there are many things that show that it is possible for the moon to have been split at one point. Anyways, next one. Elephants turned into chewed grass by stones dropped from birds. These are a few of Quran's perfect words. Alright, this one's referring to Surah Al-Fil verses 1 to 5. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Have you not seen how your Lord dealt with the companions of the elephants? He has sent against them birds in flocks. So the story behind this is that before the birth of the beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Kaaba was owned by the Quraysh tribe, which despite the violent nature of the other Arab tribes, enjoyed peace and good relations with all of the tribes, and had an almost sacred status because the site of the Kaaba once had many idols placed there which were owned by all the Arab tribes and because of this Mecca became very wealthy and it enjoyed a lot of economic activities from all the tribes coming there and back to worship the idols it even became a common stop for travelers now there was this king of Yemen called Abraha who saw this he saw how much economic activity Mecca enjoyed and he got very jealous so he built his own Kaaba to try and have similar economic activity in his own city and of course the Arabs didn't like that they took it as a joke some people even went and ransacked the place so Abraha got very upset and he thought that the best way to divert the economic activity from Mecca to his own city would be to destroy the Kaaba. And of course because they didn't have bulldozers or wrecking balls at the time, the best thing to use would be elephants. So his army mounted an army of elephants and made their way to the Kaaba. Now to protect the Kaaba and to show people that you shouldn't mess with the Kaaba, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent birds with stones to kill the army. The birds dropped stones on the people on top of the elephants and killed them, leaving them looking like chewed up hay. Now the reason why stones were used was because all of the Meccans ran away because they couldn't kill elephants. Elephants are basically unstoppable. Using birds was also more supernatural. It made people even more scared of messing with the Kaaba because it had unknown supernatural consequences. This is of course another miracle which relies on the existence of God. So you can't use this as an argument against Islam. Millennia ruled men at the time of the flood. Alright, so here Saiten is talking about Nuh alayhi salam, who according to the Quran, chapter 29 verse 14, gave dawah for 1,000 years take 50 or 950 years, and it's presumed that he lived for a bit longer than this. And honestly, there isn't much to say about this, I mean, it's just another miracle. And as I've been saying earlier, using a miracle to criticize a religion doesn't make much sense, because if God exists and he is all-powerful, he can cause this miracle to happen. So if you want to criticize a religion, you don't look at the miracles, you look at something like, I don't know, theology or prophecies.
Your body was fashioned from one clot of blood. So here Saitan is referring to chapter 23 verse 14 of the Quran. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Then we made the sperm drop into a clinging clot, and we made the clot into a lump, and so on. So the criticism here is that apparently this clinging clot is referring to a clot of blood. And this isn't entirely accurate, because the Arabic word used here is ala katan, which can mean congealed clot. But like many other Arabic words, it can have several translations. So one of them is a piece of congealed blood, but it's also translated as something that sticks to something else, and it's also translated into a leech. In fact, alakat is the main word used for leech in Arabic, even today. So the truth is that in the womb, the embryo does indeed stick to something. It sticks to the lining of the uterus about six days after fertilization. Not only that, but around this time also, the embryo becomes leech-shaped, as shown by this image. So instead of clinging clot, some people do translate it as leech-like substance because that is exactly what it is and it fits perfectly with science and the original Arabic word. Now, 9 plus 10. No evolution but men turn to apes. Okay, so I've made a video on the first line, linked here, but I can summarize it real quick. Basically, not all Muslims disbelieve in evolution. There's nothing in the Quran or Hadiths that explicitly say we shouldn't believe in evolution. We only believe that Adam and Eve were miraculous creations of Allah. Furthermore, whether Adam and Eve evolved is also unknown. I mean, it's possible that they were the ancestors of Homo sapiens, but also the Neanderthals the Thals and the Denethsovans. Many Muslims do continue to disbelieve in evolution, and I completely understand why. They make some great points against Darwinistic macroevolution that even some atheist evolutionary biologists make, such as the fact that there isn't actually much empirical evidence for macroevolution. The most you'll find is evidence for microevolution in bacteria and insects. But the best thing for macroevolution is homology and genealogy, which honestly do work off the back of many inferences and assumptions. Anyways, for more on the side of accepting evolution, check out Dr. Shoaib's work, and for more on creationism or the side against evolution, check out Dr. Ayad Kunaibi's work. Now, men turn to apes. This is referring to verse 65 of Surah Al-Baqarah, where Allah talks about Jews that transgressed on the Sabbath day. He said to them, be apes despised. Now, there are two interpretations for this. One is that Allah is simply saying this metaphorically, as in their demeanor or their behavior was like that of apes. But the more predominant and valid interpretation is that Allah literally turned these people into apes. And I say it's more authentic because there is an authentic hadith in Sahih Muslim, where the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, talks about this. Ibn Mas'ud asked him if all the monkeys and the pigs came from people who were transformed, and he replied saying, Allah does not enable those who have been transformed to have offspring or children, directly implying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has indeed transformed people to monkeys and pigs in the past. Now, why did Allah turn Jews into apes? Now, of course, because they transgressed against the Sabbath day, but also on a warning and a lesson to those after, and to teach them not to be ungrateful and disobedient. And again, this is a miracle. It's not claiming to be a general rule. We're not saying that people actually devolve. We're simply saying that it is possible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to transform someone into a pig or a monkey because he is omniscient, omnipotent, and omni-everything, you know? And again, you can't use disbelief in a miracle as a reason to disbelieve in Allah because if Allah exists, he can do what he wants. Next line. Virus is made just for our delectation. All right, so here, Saiten again misquoted this verse. He puts 426 when it's actually 226, or Surah Al-Baqarah. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he isn't afraid to put down the example of the mosquito or even that which is smaller. The Arabic word is something more like that which is beyond, but beyond in this case is referring to things that are beyond in smallness, if you know what I mean. So yeah, what he's saying is that the mosquito and things that are even smaller than the mosquito are ayats, or proofs that there is an intelligent creator. And subhanAllah, when you look at the intricate design of these uh, little microorganisms and even insects, you see that subhanAllah, like they, it's so perfect. Like if you look at some of the structures on mosquitoes or when you look at the flagellum of a bacteria, you'll see that these little intricate structures are just like, how is this gonna evolve into existence? Like that's the question. Like look at this stuff, bro. You can see that there must be an intelligent creator because this is, this stuff is just amazing. But I guess you could say that this is purely subjective. However, I will say that if you look at Saiten's lyric, you'll see that it has absolutely nothing to do with virus is giving Allah pleasure, or about anything being delectable to Allah, this is a complete misinterpretation. What the verse is saying is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not afraid to show us the example of the mosquito of or that which is smaller. There is no indication of anything being delectable to anyone. The viruses aren't delectable to us or to Allah. So yeah, this is a bit of a mid-verse. Saiten himself even admitted that this line is kind of mid. He also told me that he has doubts about the existence of viruses, which I hope was uh, ironic. 
Anyways, next one. From Smoke the Earth volunteered its own formation. Okay, this one's one of my favorites. It's referring to verse 11 of Surah Fusilat, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains how he turned towards the heaven when it was still smoke and told it and the earth to come into being, willingly or unwillingly. So this is actually fully true. Like, I don't even need to give you any explanation of Arabic or mental gymnastics. Like, this is just objectively true, right? The earth was made from smoke. In fact, according to National Geographic, and I quote, billions of years ago, earth along with the rest of our solar system was entirely unrecognizable, existing as only an enormous cloud of dust and gas. Eventually, a mysterious occurrence, one that even the world's foremost scientists have yet been unable to determine, created a disturbance in that cloud dust, setting forth a string of events that would lead to the formation of life as we know it. This is the scientific consensus that is present among all the people who study possible theories for the formation of the earth. First the earth and the entire solar system was smoke and then it became planets and the sun. Now you can still go on and criticize the fact that the heavens and the earth willingly came into being because according to atheistic knowledge like inanimate objects can't make choices right? But this is a purely metaphysical claim which is not falsifiable or able to be proved or disproved with empirical science. It's just a belief we have. As Muslims we believe that every single thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created is worshipping him and this includes includes inanimate objects. And by the way, worshipping doesn't mean actively praying and reciting dhikr. Sure, it might somehow be supernaturally doing that, but we're actually saying that worshipping means just obeying Allah and not disobeying him basically, doing what he wants us to do and doing what pleases him. So it could be that by everything worshipping Allah, it means that everything is simply just following the natural laws of nature and physics that Allah has prescribed. So this verse could just be referring to the fact that the earth and the heavens came into being without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having to force it to. In other words, the heavens and the earth came into being from smoke without having to be prompted or without having to be forced. It just happened according to the normal laws of physics. Anyways, next one. Worms in communities milk from cow's bellies. Quranic facts with which science agrees. Alright, so we've got two here. The first one is referring to Surah Al-Atnam, verse 38. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that all living beings are in communities like we are. Now, there is no explicit mention of worms, but I assume that Sai Tenjo just put it in because worms just sound a bit goofy and I think it rhymed. Anyway, so Allah is referring to every single animal and every single living being, saying that they're all in communities similar to how we are. But the verse isn't saying that animals are just like humans, no. Only that there are parallels between the social structures of animals and humans, which is true. And you can literally see this with your own eyes. You can see ants, you can see herds of elephants, packs of wolves. I mean, even worms live in herds, according to the International Journal of Behavioral Biology. They influence each other's behavior and they use touch to communicate. So Sai Ten, this, but it is indeed true that some animals live and thrive on their own without needing a pack. This includes bears, rhinos, leopards, etc. But notice that this verse isn't saying that animals are in communities of the same species. No, there is no distinction like that. So it would be valid to say that this verse could also be referring to communities made up of different species. And if you were to look at it biologically, that is exactly what you see. In ecology, this is the exact word used for a group of species that live in the same habitat, a community. And you'll see that these communities, directly or indirectly, have parallels with our human social structures. You can see that all the animals depend on each other. The tertiary consumers depend on the secondary consumers, the secondary consumers depend on the primary consumers, and the primary consumers depend on the producers. And then it also goes the other way. Some producers rely on the feed species of the consumers, either to spread the trees or for nutrients to be soaked up through the ground. And you'll see that apex predators, well it doesn't seem like it, apex predators actually depend on the producers because the producers make the consumers that the apex predator eats. So you can see that without the producers, there would be no apex predator, and without the apex predator, there probably wouldn't be any producers, because then there would be too many consumers that would eat all the producers. There is an intricate balance in place, even if animals are in solitude. If there is too much of one species, then it affects all of the other species in the same community. And you see the exact same thing in human social structures. Sure, it seems like the 50-year-old billionaire has nothing to do with the 17-year-old McDonald's worker. But in fact, it could be that the 17-year-old McDonald's worker served a coffee or a McChicken to one of the employees of the billionaire, which in turn makes the employee productive and causes the billionaire to make money. This is just one scenario, but you'll see that human social structures work in basically the exact same way. Like if there were too many billionaires, for example, there would be way more poor people. And in some cases that is what's happening, but you'll also see that if there were too many McDonald's workers, then the people at the top of McDonald's would suffer because they'd have to pay too many wages and there'd be more McDonald's workers than there are customers and so on and so on. You see, there are these intricate social structures, both in human society and ecological community. 
communities. Now the next thing, milk from cows' bellies. This is from Surah An-Nahl, verse number 66, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, For you in grazing livestock is a lesson. We give you drink from what is in their bellies between excretion and blood. Pure milk, palatable to drinkers. Now in order to understand what this verse is actually talking about, we need to look at the biology of how milk is made. So after the cow has eaten its food, which mostly consists of difficult to digest fibers, such as cellulose and other complex polysaccharides, the food goes into the rumen and the reticulum, which are respectively the cow's first and second stomachs. Here food is further broken down by microorganisms into slightly smaller and simpler fibrils. This is also where the cow chews its cud and, you know, chews their partially digested food again and then it goes back into their stomach. After a while, this passes into the omasum and then the abomasum, where the food is chemically digested and all the microbes from earlier are killed. After this, the food goes into the small intestine and this is what the Qur'an is talking about. In cattle, there's a lesson. Allah gives us to drink from what is in their bellies between excretion and blood. So there are two things to note here. Firstly, the word belly is actually referring to the entire abdominal area of a cow, which includes the udders and the digestive system. Secondly, between excretion and blood is actually referring to the origin of the milk being from between the cow's intestines and the blood. Because the Arabic word fardin can be translated to excretion, bowels, intestines, digested food, and so on. But to understand this, we have to go back to the biology of milk production. So the food is now in the small intestines, right? And thanks to the earlier steps, most of the food has been digested into smaller, simpler biomolecules, such as mono and disaccharides, um, glycerol, fatty acids, and so on. And from here, the semi-permeable membranes of the cow's villi in the small intestines absorb these molecules by active transport. And then the capillaries inside of these villi collect the biomolecules and transport them to the udders by the blood. And here, of course, the molecules get processed into milk by the mammary glands inside of the udders. So subhanAllah, you can see the complexity of something that seems as simple as milk. But alhamdulillah, it's amazing. But yeah, you can see that these biomolecules were absorbed by semi-permeable membranes between the intestines and the blood. This is exactly what the verse is talking about. But if we were to further analyze the Arabic, you'll see that the word used for between is baini, which is used for, you know, two things being spatially between each other, but it is also used to express the idea of bringing two things or people together. And we can see that the digestive system and the blood cooperate in the production of milk. And yes, it happens in the belly because at the time of revelation, this was the general word used for the abdominal area, including the udders. And I think it still is today. So, Subhanallah. And actually, Sai 10 did say that these are Quranic facts with which science agrees. Both of these, <laughs> he's correct with both of these. These are indeed Quranic facts with which science agrees. Next one. Semen comes from between backbone and ribs. Okay, this is one of the most common criticisms and it comes from Surah at tariq verses 5 to 7. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Let man observe from what he was created. He was created from a fluid ejected, emerging from between the backbone and the ribs. So the criticism here is that the Quran says that the semen was created between the backbone and the ribs. So this criticism assumes that the fluid in question is semen and that semen is the thing that comes from between the backbone and the ribs. And we'll talk about this in a second. All right, so there are three valid ways to look at this first. For the first one, you can say that the fluid in question is sperm, and yet yeah, sperm is made in the nuts, which are anatomically below the backbone and the ribs. However, after spermatogenesis, the sperm moves up from the nuts through the epididymis and up through the vas deferens or the sperm duct. And then this goes up near the seminal vesicle. Now the seminal vesicle is very important here because the seminal vesicle contains the majority of the fluids that are ejected during ejaculation. And it acts mostly as a vector for the sperm and also contains molecules that keep the sperm nourished and alive. Now, anatomically speaking, the seminal vesicle is between the backbone and the ribs. Assuming that included in between the backbone and the ribs is between the backbone and anything that is parallel to it and the ribs. So the penis is parallel to the backbone and the seminal vesicle is above the penis. Therefore, the seminal vesicle is between the backbone and the ribs. But this is only one approach. Again, there are three. Another way to look at this is that the fluid in question is referring to the woman's eggs, which are created above the vagina, which is parallel to the backbone, and are then ejected as a gushing fluid during menstruation. And the third interpretation is that yes, humans were created from a gushing fluid. This could have been sperm or it could have been the eggs. However, the next verse isn't actually referring to the fluid. It's actually referring to the human that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about, right? It's saying that the human was created from a gushing fluid and the human emerged from the between the backbone and the ribs, 
which is true because when a woman is pregnant, the baby is between her backbone and the ribs, and this is completely uncontroversial and it is scientifically correct. And as far as I know, this last interpretation is also mentioned in a few tafsirs. Next one. The night is a veil casting darkness beneath. All right, so this one's Surah Al Araf, verse number 54, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He makes the day and the night overlap in rapid succession. Now, this is also translated as He covers the night with the day, chasing it rapidly. Both of these are translations of the same thing. And obviously it is accurate because the night does overlap the day and the day does overlap the night. And this is in accordance with other verses in the Quran, such as verse 5 of Surah az zumar where Allah says that he wraps the night into the day and wraps the day over the night. The word yukawir is used here which can mean rolling or wrapping. And this is in accordance with the previous verse that I mentioned. And I have to say though, like this like, this is probably the weakest thing here. Like, do you really think that anyone could possibly believe in this? Like, look at this diagram. Look at this. Do you, th do you actually think someone would be, you know, that stupid to believe that? Like, come on, bro. How can the night be a napkin that... Oh my goodness, bro. Anyways, next one. Then the dead can be raised up with slices of beef. Okay, this one's referring to Surah Al-Baqarah verses 72 and 73. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Remember when you slew a man and disputed over it, but Allah was to bring out that which you were concealing. So we said, Strike him with a part of the cow. Thus does Allah bring the dead to life, and he shows you his signs that you might reason. So the story behind this is that someone was murdered and there was a bit of an Among Us murder mystery. Everyone was throwing accusations at each other and blaming each other and whatnot and they couldn't find out who was the input, um, the culprit. So they went to Musa alayhi salam to solve this murder mystery. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the Israelites to kill a cow. This achieved two things. Firstly, it showed the Israelites that there is no divinity in cows because there was zero consequences to killing this cow. And it also showed Allah's power and omnipotence because then he commanded them to strike the dead body with a piece of the cow. And then the murdered person truthfully pointed out who the murderer was. And so the murder mystery was concluded. At this point, three things were demonstrated to the Israelites. Firstly, there is no divinity in cows. Secondly, Allah can do anything, he's omnipotent. And the third thing is that Allah will always know the truth behind what people dispute about. So this was another miracle. I can't just grab a piece of steak and strike someone with it and expect them to come alive. No, this is not a general principle or a general rule. This is just a miracle that was like a one-off thing, you know? And if you want to disbelieve in a miracle, again, you have to first disbelieve in God because you can't use a miracle as a reason to disbelieve in God. And of course, this is a miracle, so it can't be in conjunction with science. Otherwise, it would cease to be a miracle. Next thing. Simple instructions to follow until each relative knows who will get what in a will. Okay, so this isn't really an error or anything like that. It's just a personal criticism on the part of Saiten or the rationalizer. And this is a reference to Surah An-Nisa verses 11 and 12, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains all of the rules and mathematics behind, um, you know, wills and inheritance and whatnot. And yeah, these verses are quite long and complicated and I'm not even going to try to attempt to wrap my head around it. But yeah, it is quite difficult. But this verse never claims to be simple. And besides, the common person doesn't need to wrap their heads around this because we have skilled sheikhs, we have skilled mathematicians, and we have intelligent people to actually work this stuff out for us. And nowadays, we even have an online calculator for inheritance where you can just put in all of your relatives and their details, put in how much money you have, and you can instantly find out how much money everyone gets according to Sharia law. So yeah, this is not an error of the Quran, and this isn't even something that Muslims say. Nobody ever said that the inheritance stuff is simple. Nobody said that. Next one. The moon follows the sun, which then sets in the mud. Okay, these two, are, bro, we hear them way too often. But yeah, firstly, the moon follows the sun, and this is in reference to Surah Ash-Shams, verses 1 and 2. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, by the sun and its brightness and the moon that follows it. This one's simple really because it's referring to three things which are all true. The first is that visually from our perspective, the moon does appear to follow the sun. So of course, an audience from 1400 years ago would have no problem with this. They'd just see, okay, um, moon follows the sun. Yeah, that's true. And the next thing, does the moon literally follow the sun? Well, obviously not in the way that it looks. The sun and the moon obviously aren't both orbiting the earth. We know that. However, technically the moon does follow the sun in a different way. We know that the moon orbits the earth and is bound by its gravity. And we know that the earth orbits the sun and is bound by its gravity. But what some people also don't know is that the sun is also moving itself. It is orbiting the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And because of that, we see the sun is moving. The earth is following the sun because the earth is moving with it. And because of that, the moon is also technically following the sun because if the sun wasn't moving, the moon wouldn't be moving. 
Anyways, now, the moon sets in the mud. This one is also very common, and it refers to verse 86 of Surah Al-Kahf, where a man called Zul Karnain was traveling until he reached the setting point of the sun, which was at the time a muddy spring. Now, this is not all implying that the sun sets in a puddle of mud, no. Rather, it just appeared so. And this is emphasized by the word used, wajadaha, which implies perspective and what someone sees or senses, rather than something that is objectively true. It's just like when you're watching the sunset, right? It looks like it goes into the horizon, it looks like it goes into the mountain, or whatever you're viewing it from. But obviously, it doesn't actually do that, it just appears so. I mean, you could even use the same goofy argument against English speakers. Because we say that the sun sets, but obviously, if you were to think of it scientifically like some nerd, you'd see that, um, actually, the sun doesn't set, because it's the Earth's rotation that causes the sun to appear as if it's setting. So actually by saying sunset you're wrong. Like this is completely stupid. The sun doesn't set, it just looks like it, but that doesn't matter. It's just the way we say things. So you're dumb if you actually think that this is what the Quran says. Next one. The earth is spread flat and stars fall as they should. Okay, the earth is spread flat. This one's talking about verse 53 of Surah Taha, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He is the one who has made the earth for you as a bed spread out. The Arabic word used here is mahdan, saying that Allah made the earth like a mahdan. So yeah, this is a simile. The word mahdan translates to bed or cradle. Some people even translate it as a carpet. And it seems that the typical interpretation of this is that the word mahdan is referring to the earth's crust as being a carpet or a bed because the crust of the earth is relatively thin and it blocks a lot of the heat that's underneath the crust and this is supported by what follows it Allah says that he has set in the earth roadways and that he sends down rain from the sky causing various types of plants to grow both of these things are things that are in relation to the earth's mantle or the upper layer of the earth so for the plants it's the dirt and for the roadways is obviously the road which is on the outer layer of the earth you know what I mean the word mahdan is also interpreted as implying safety and comfort for us because the earth is relatively safe compared to other planets, especially with its crust covering the hot mantle and of course the magnetosphere which protects the earth from solar winds and meteorites and things like that. And I understand that my defense of this verse might not be completely satisfactory, but other verses in the Quran can be used to address this. Such as again Surah Az-Zumar verse 5, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he wraps the night into the day and wraps the day around the night, which implies circular and spherical motion, which can only happen with a spherical earth. Now, the stars fall as they should. This is in reference to the start of Surah at takwir where Allah states what will happen during the moments preceding Yawm al qiyamah or the Day of Judgment. And Allah says, When the sun is put out, and when the stars fall down, and when the mountains are blown away, and when pregnant camels are left neglected, and so on. A bunch of things that will happen during the last hour are mentioned. So this is referring to a phenomenon that, to our knowledge, is unnatural. This will happen during the final hour, in which presumably miraculous things and unnatural things will happen. So we cannot comment on the scientific improbability of these things happening, because these things will be miraculous. However, you could also interpret this as referring to the Big Crunch, a scientific theory that proposes that the end of the universe will occur in an equal and opposite way to the start of the universe, or the Big Bang. In other words, the universe will very rapidly shrink until it's become basically just one little singularity. And this is compatible with the Quran because in a way the stars will fall according to the modern scientific understanding. I do need to stress again that these verses are referring to something that will happen on the day of judgment. So if it is completely scientifically inaccurate, then there's nothing for us to say about it because this is a miraculous thing that Allah will cause. And also the big crunch theory is not 100% proved. It's just a theory. And it's not as set in stone as the big bang theory. So we shouldn't conclusively say that this is what the Quran is referring to because it could be that this is just not something that will happen. Now, the final line of this song. When you tell me, Allah will burn me, and it makes me sad. I simply remember such ludicrous things as the Quran is easy to understand. I actually think that this is a really effective ending to this song. I mean, I've just recorded this like 40 minute video explaining all of these uh, misunderstandings, criticisms and misconceptions. So it would be dumb for me to sit here and tell you that the Quran is easy to understand. It isn't. But there are a few really good reasons for this. But before I get to that, the verse provided is actually verse 22 of Surah al kamar where Allah says that he has made the Quran easy to remember not to understand and indeed like alhamdulillah we have about 200 million hafis of the quran so this isn't even an issue like this is just objectively true the quran is easy to remember now there are a few reasons why the quran isn't easy to understand but firstly i'll point out that yes allah does refer to the quran
on as being clear, but clear does not mean the same thing as being easy to understand. By clear, it's referring to the Quran as being a clear guidance with clear rules. The Quran never claims to be easy to understand, and it isn't. And this is because the Quran is the word of Allah. It's multi-layered and it has many, many meanings in almost every verse, all of which are relevant to different people from different eras, sometimes in different ways. So understanding it is bound to not always be easy. But this is why we have hadiths and tafsiris, which explain authentic interpretations of the Quran. And of course, we've also got modern scholars who interpret the Quran from a more modern and informed perspective. The last thing I'll say about this is that this video being 40 minutes long makes the Quran seem really, really difficult to understand. But most of this video is just me talking about backstory, you know, like I'm not actually uh, directly talking about misconceptions in a lot of this. I'm just giving backstory and I'm teaching you about things, right? So I could have explained these things much quicker. And also most of this is just stupidity and misunderstandings that I don't even need to tell you about, right? But I mean, if I skip through things, then people would probably complain about it. And also we don't know Arabic, right? If we knew Arabic, this would be a lot easier because it's for a lot of this, I just have to explain Arabic to you and that kind of stuff. So, I mean, if we had background knowledge, obviously it would be a lot easier to understand. But yeah, that was the entire song, The Sound of Muslims. And here Saiten also gives a massive throbbing thanks to the rationalizer who wrote the original song. And then I assume that Saiten just made a few tweaks, did the animation and then sung it. I'd like to give my own thanks to Adam al Shahwani, who helped me with the majority of the researching for this video, as well as a few other members of my Discord server. I really couldn't have done it without you guys. But yeah, if you have any questions, counter arguments, additional thoughts, or if you found any mistakes in this video, please just, you know, comment down below and let me know. I try to read most comments. And if you'd like to support me in making these videos, please consider becoming a member of the channel or a Patreon, and then you will gain access to my members only Discord server. Like, wallahi, I would appreciate it so much because I put so much effort and time into these videos, so, you know, a little support is always very, very appreciated. One last thing, one last, I, I promise this is the last thing, right? I've just got a disclaimer for Psy10 and The Rationalizer. If you're watching this video, I just have to say, this video isn't meant to be an attack on you and your videos. I'm sure that from a religious standpoint and from a natural psychological standpoint, it is acceptable for me to like attack you back because you are basically attacking my religion. But I don't believe in combining logical arguments and emotions. So I've refrained from personal insults and arguments that are solely based on emotions. And I understand that me making a response to an eight year old song does kind of seem like a cheap shot. It seems very too late, but um, th see, this is not the purpose of the video, right? It's it's not some kind of a back and forth that I'm looking for. This video has just, this video has created so many uh, goofy goobers who think these things about the Quran. So I just have to um, correct it a little bit. You know, I have to teach people because wallahi, like this is goofy. Like I actually see people on Reddit using these as arguments. It's goofy. Anyways, that's about it. May Allah bless you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.